Yeah. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the second in the series of conversations on school books in India. I'm Vardrajan Narayanan, and I'm a member of the School of Education at Azim Premji University, Bengaluru. In the first conversation with Dr. T. V. Venkateshwaran, we discussed science textbooks and popular science books in Tamil in 19th century Madras presidency. This evening, we have with us Professor Abhijit Gupta, who is a professor in the Department of English at Jadapur University. Now, along with uh, scholars like uh, Professor Rimi Chatterjee, Ulrike Stark, A.R. Venkataja Bradi, and, uh, and many others, Professor Gupta has helped give shape to the field of studies on the book and its history in India. In this regard, four volumes that he co-edited with his former colleague at Jadapur, Professor Chopin Chakravarti, have been pivotal, bringing together an array of scholars and exploring an unimaginably wide spectrum of topics. These volumes are print areas published in 2004, movable types in 2008, the new word order 2011, and founts of knowledge, which has been the most recent volume in the series uh, published in 2015. He was also the associate editor for entries on South Asia uh, for the Oxford Companion of the Book, which was published in 2010. Uh, he directed the extremely valuable project on the compilation of long title catalog of printed materials in ba uh, Bangla from 80, uh, materials from 1801 onwards. And also along with, it was not just a long title catalog, it also had the uh, location register for each of the items. <clears throat> And uh, he, uh, so that was, that's been a major project that he has been part of and directed it. Uh, and he currently heads the Jadapur University Press. And for, he is also at work on two monographs to do with book history, and one of which is due to come out sometime soon, perhaps in a few months from now. In this conversation, we shall talk about book history as a field of study or a discipline its significance for the study of school books uh, for both historical and contemporary, and finally on two of the uh, important presses or publishing organizations in early colonial Bengal, namely the Baptist Mission Press and the Calcutta Book School Book Society, both of which played uh, important roles in the production of books for use in schools in printed form. And if time permits, we may uh, also talk about a few other uh, presses. Format for this session is simple. In the first uh, one hour, or perhaps a little more, uh, I asked Professor Gupta a few questions based on his areas of interest and published work, and then open the floor for questions from those who have joined us live for this, this evening. All those who are watching this session live can post their uh, questions on the chat box to the right side of your screen and we shall take them up for discussion later in this session. Thank you very much, Professor Gupta, uh, Gupta for joining us and being a part of this series. Now, let, uh, if, if we could begin, you know, so the term book history, so, or history of the book, as a discipline has quickly emerged in the last few decades, it's a very prominent one, a very live, uh, uh, extremely uh, vibrant field of study. Uh, it has a dedicated journal. It has several now, you know, many academic institutions uh, have their own centers uh, in focused, on the study, uh, focused on the study of the book. Uh, there is even a prize called the Sharp Prize for this, uh, for excellent work produced in this area. Yet outside the circle of specialists working in this area, if this field as a whole and the developments in it are more or less uh, pro probably not very well known. Perhaps then it is, uh, it's only appropriate that we begin by asking you, you know, what is book history and uh, what does a book historian seek to do? Thank you very much, Varda, for uh, uh, inviting me to be part of this very promising and very interesting series of talks. Um, and I'm uh, personally very happy to be in a sense, resuming a conversation with Varda, which began 10 years ago when he was, uh, or even longer when he visited Jadavka University, seems a lifetime ago, in 2009 or 10 it was, I think. And uh, so um, uh, so this this really is a kind of a, a very unique opportunity to talk in a very 
informal but nonetheless very uh, engaged way with uh, um, uh, a certain uh, aspect of uh, Indian book history. Now, uh, to uh, um, very quickly try and respond to your first question uh, uh, about book history and uh, what it uh, seeks to do, um, it, it, is, it is a very broad tent, uh, as, as, as you will, or very hospitable discipline. It is, it is interdisciplinary. It is to do with um, uh, every aspect of the labor that goes into the making of a book to be very to very simply. So you, you're looking at uh, either the putty form of the book or the printed form or the digital form. It does not matter what technological avatar of the book we are talking about. The finished product that reaches the reader uh, only does so after going through a number of processes which are invisible, most for most of the time invisible to us. So one of the things Book History tries, tries to do is to draw our attention to this invisible labor. Uh, to this ecosystem of labor, which makes the book possible and which indeed is, uh, uh, which also uh, is in conversation with what the book is about. In other words, the uh, uh, the, con the contents of the book. Um, but we are also, so, you know, if to, be, to put it, you know, very, very um, basic terms, you're, we are looking at both the production and the consumption of the book. So that's the, pro uh, the two processes uh, and the personnel and the various institutional as well as uh, structural legal issues associated with it. Um, now, this is uh, as you can as you, as you can imagine, this could this could be applicable to any 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 book on any subject. You could uh, you could interrogate. You could look at a book. You could look at the processes which inform the making of the book. Um, and uh, with with any with, with with any any kind of printed material, really. I mean, again, when I when I use the term book, um, you should, I'm uh, I I I, uh, I we are trying to indicate as wide a range of material, textual material as possible. Uh, so it could be hand scribal, handwritten. It could be printed. It could be digital. It could be a novel. It could be a pamphlet. It could be a map. It could be a songbook, and so on and forth. So every every such product. Um, has its own history of uh, production. And then, of course, there is the history of consumption where we are looking at how um, the product reaches its consumer or its user. Or um, So it could be a reader, it could be a library, it could be a depository, it could be a book club, it could be a range of uh, users. So again, we are trying to look at all these processes. So obviously, you know, you cannot do it all at the same time. You need a certain um, uh, uh, access to a certain um, uh, uh, quanta of data, of resources, of archives, of material histories in order to do this kind of history. But um, you know, very very quickly, that is that is what book historians do. As a literature person, for instance, I teach in a literature literature department. We uh, and, and depending on, I, I, I suppose, what we uh, uh, what 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 we profess, as it were, um, we can make book, book history do various things. So for for a literature department, we uh, it's it's useful for me to try and use book history to explain that the um, words on a page are not just the product, unmediated product of the author's intention, reaching completely. Uh, you know, sort of emerging out of his head, as it were, and re reaching the reader without any kind of uh, intercessions. We try and look at these very mediated process and try to do try to draw attention to how these mediations affect what we are reading on the page and how, for instance, the materiality of what we are reading or listening to um, uh, 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 impact every act of reading that every individual reader is carrying out. So. We are looking at reading histories as well, readerships, uh, both the individual as well as collective history. So it's, it's a kind of, as I said, very broad tent. So, you know, you take a little snapshot of whatever process that you can talk about and you do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, so this term begins to be the term book history or history of the book begins to be used something, uh, say, some like, something like uh, four three or four decades ago. But if you look at, say, India, uh, you know, you would see that, you know, the origins of printing, the introduction of printing technology, uh, profiles of publishers, very important figures associated with the Bazal mission or uh, HAL mission, um, uh, so, uh, the introduction of various works into the continent, you know, these have been the focus of uh, uh, very many earlier studies as well. Uh, before this field as a distinctive one sort of uh, uh, emerged in uh, in this country. For instance, one, I mean, so there are all of these studies. And of course, there are 
pan-Indian accounts available. So Prayolkar's is one. Uh, B.S. Keshavan's uh, is another. And perhaps there are many more. I mean, I'm only citing a couple of them. Uh, uh, and once you sort of include the manuscript uh, manuscripts into the ambit of book and now you can source perhaps these some of these studies go way back into the 19th century as well so uh, now uh, yeah with its recensions so you know given that all, a lot of such work has been produced say in the last 100 years or so how does uh, the new uh, forays into this area you know, distinguish itself from what some of these figures were trying to do earlier? Okay. I think that's a, that's a very valid question and something we, which we often tend to forget because, um, see, let me take the last part of your question first. When we are looking at, let's say, manuscripts and for a, for a while, at, at least in the early decades of Brook history, much of the attention was on print. And we thought that we could look at uh, print history without looking at manuscript history, as if there was a kind of clear, clear kind of a watershed between the two. Now, and now, of course, uh, we, we have learned that this is this is not the case. That uh, there is no kind of uh, you know abrupt supersession of an old technology, and old technology does not immediately become obsolete. And uh, we know that in the history of print, at least in the West as well as in India, there would there was at least a century when the protocols of the manuscript culture or manuscript book or scribal culture uh, um, made its made their signs quite clear on the printed book. So there is, a, again, you can see a kind of conversation happening between print and manuscript. So one of the things I think we had to learn to um, acknowledge, and I think we have been acknowledging that in recent years, is that we cannot just talk about print. We cannot just talk about the digital book. We have to look at the interfaces, the intersections between these two technologies, and especially in a country like India or in a subcontinent like India, hmm. where you have uh, the orality, script, um, print, and the digital cultures all coexisting in a way which is quite hmm. remarkable hmm. and which perhaps um, you, you will not see in any other part of the world. Uh, so, it, it, you know, for, so the kind of work that was happening before, as it that is absolutely correct. Uh, uh, you know, speaking speaking prose without knowing it, as it were, um, there were a lot of uh, individual right individual scholars independent scholars and who were also doing a lot of very good work in indian languages other than english so there was work in bangla there was work in tamil there was work in malayalam there was working so and again because of the lack of translations we did not know about such work and again because they did not have a kind of broad tent to fall back on these were these works were, these such work was being done individually uh, and and but we that work for, and I can I can I can talk about Bengali for instance the work of uh, Brojendranath Bondobadhyay this sort of extraordinary figure in uh, uh, collating uh, um, the history of periodicals and newspapers and uh, literary biographies the great uh, Abdul Karim Shaitobi Sharod collection collector of manuscripts. Jyotindra Mohan Bhattacharya, the, the bibliographer and collector of manuscripts, Nikhil Shorkar, who wrote under the name Sripantho, all of these, all of them wrote in Bengali, and left a, and have left a huge corpus of works in Bengali, which uh, which we are now, which which uh, you know, it's absolutely the the the, the core of uh, book history in Bengali. Uh, but it doesn't even really matter that they were not part of a discipline as such. I mean, the whole question of discipline. Is also, mm. I mean, it, 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 it's convenient to have a discipline, it's convenient to have departments, it's convenient to have uh, uh, journals, uh, uh, a society of like minded individuals, but that does not mean it's, that's absolutely that's necessary, and that does not mean that no work can be done outside the discipline. When you talk about Priolkar and Kesavan's work, of course, I mean, and I'm particularly referring to Kesavan's work, you see, one of the reasons why Kesavan's work is both very useful and sometimes frustrating is because it tries to do perhaps too much. So you have a history of publishing, but you also have literary protocols, literary criticism coming into that. So in a sense, it's 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 a kind of a loose baggy monster which tries to sort of do everything. Um, but what it does for so what the book historian, what we take from that is the kind of um, invaluable research on the history of printing and publishing, you know, in, in a kind of magisterial way um, across centuries, across the whole, across uh, the length and breadth of the subcontinent. But I don't think any 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 scholar now would actually have, um, you know, have the nerve to do that kind of work anymore. I mean, this is again, as, as I said, a kind of um, you know, pioneers who were sort of staking out the field. And now we have been able to give more, uh, I think, focused attention on this field. So Priyolka, what Priyolka and Kesavan were doing, were, they were sort of mapping out the field for us. 
and mm. we were we were then sort of claiming little bits of the bit little bits of the field for hours and and doing our own work and at the same time going back and looking at um, uh, you know the kind of work um, that was being done that is still being done in indian languages for example in bengali by gautam bhadro who writes mostly in bengali again so i think this there is there is a very strong um, need to translate these works if we if we want to read read these works you know my my very good friend chalapati also writes in two languages he writes he, he writes in tamil he writes in it i try to write in bangla as much as i can so i, I think this is something which um, you know as as indian scholars you know, it, it's a kind of a um uh, advantage that we have that we are able to work in several languages uh, read in several languages look at research in several languages and we need to make that uh, more available more accessible to um, uh, scholars hmm. now you know uh, so you uh, told us what the uh, term how it sort of stands for a particular domain but they you know there are also certain other terms that have been that have been used for instance you know one such as the history of reading now if you take a uh, say the work of uh, robert bunton at least in the anglophone world uh, or the english speaking world as uh, something which has been very important you know some of his works have also to do with readership how thing uh, you know the readership how books were received circulated and so on and uh, this was so, this was sort of followed up by many uh, many of his co uh, colleagues then at princeton you know for for instance one can always think of the long essay that lisa jardine and uh, uh, anthony grafton wrote on how you know Gra gabriel harvey uh, rents living so you know sometimes you find historians of the book you know getting into hist histories of reading as uh, writing histories of reading as well i think in our own country there are many who have uh, you know been dealing with indian materials one can think of uh, priya joshi's work uh, 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 you know on the novel you have also written on uh, the double decker novels women novelists uh, in the 19th and early 20th century and there are many who have looked at you know how readership uh, played a very important role in the constitution of the public sphere and so there have been many studies of that such kind so you know how does this sphere, you know uh, uh, series of study that uh, talk about histories of reading uh, stand in relation to the history of the book arc is it one being part the other or are there ways in say part way where they part ways of uh, how do they stand in relation to one another no i don't think they part ways at all and the history of reading is an integral part of uh, the history of the book because without readers what there would be no book so you know we are you we are looking at uh, uh, but it's also very difficult to research or very difficult to do now the reason is that while it is sometimes possible though in the case of india we have a problem because most publishers or um, have not left their archives so you know if you're working on let us say a firm like uh, um, oxford university press or bentley or macmillan and so on and forth they most of these publishers have deposited their archives with libraries of record now uh, in in the case of india that is or south asia that's been a problem because uh, a we haven't really had a culture of conservation in that sense uh, not uh, uh, or we did not think that these records were valuable so we sold these records or we threw them away or they were um, you know they went uh, 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 the forces that select unnaturally against paper uh, sort of consume them now it is even more difficult to do work on history of reading because readers typically do not they read and run they do not leave records of what they read now again i mean that is why classics such as the cheese and the worm by carlo ginsberg where he's writing about uh, a miller called menocchio who who was who was tortured by the inquisition and therefore the inquisition inquisitorial courts have record of what he reads and therefore it was possible to postulate about what the intellectual uh, life of a miller like menocchio might have had in the 6th, 17th 16th century now we have hardly any records of that kind where we are about where where we have insight into the mind of a particular reader or indeed a community of readers so think of a, think of another I, i'll give you another example think of science fiction in the 1930s and 40s where science fiction readers as they read they also became uh, creators of fanzines or or cyclostyle magazines called fanzines which they produced in their bedroom or in their garage they just needed a cyclostyle or a what was called a mimeograph machine so as they read they footnoted the genre they created the arcana so the uh, so so all these uh, you know fanzines um, created painstakingly on uh, ribbonless computers and with a inkless stylus are 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 uh, 
extraordinary guide mm. to uh, readers' responses, readers' mm. tastes, a kind of almost a kind of Freemasonry of taste. Now, it's very difficult to find that kind of intimate history, what I would call in a very intimate history of the book, if you like, because you see, and, 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 and historians like Gautam Bhadra have gestured us repeatedly towards that direction that it's not enough to look at you know, publishing houses, uh, official histories, institutional histories. Look at how the reader um, has an intimate history of the book. So, you know, how do you, what do you do with the book? What are the emotional needs that the book fulfills? What do you write in it? What do you, how do you gift it? What kind of uh, economy of gifting does it enter? So there are various ways in which readers relate to the artifact called the book. To be able to write that history would perhaps be the most rewarding of, 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 of the sent up, uh, you know, this process. But it's also very difficult to do because there are such gaps. I mean, I'm currently struggling in a manuscript which I'm writing uh, um, when I'm talking, when I'm, when I'm trying to speculate about, let us say, in the early 19th century, European missionaries in India sent out literally millions of tracts and Bibles into the uh, in, into the hinterland. But we have absolutely or very few records of how they were actually received, were they read, were they repurposed for paper bags, what happened to them? We are literally thinking of million, millions of tracts. Um, so, so you know, that, that kind of missing history, that kind of, where we have to sort of use our imagination to a certain extent, um, plausibility, uh, we, have to, we have to look at patterns, that's, that's, that's very challenging to do, but that I think is certainly within the province of um, book, book history, if, if that answers your question. It yeah, does. Uh, you know, the uh, responses to earlier of my uh, early, uh, uh, the first set of questions, clearly you drew attention to the kind of gaps that a book historian in India would often have to encounter and find alternative ways, if at all it is possible to, you know, uh, mitigate the kind of issue that uh, she might be facing when writing an account. But uh, if, would you also tell us about what are some of the theoretical discussions that sort of animate this field? And are there the theoretical questions? You know, you have been uh, a part of the community of book historians in India. So what are some of those issues that have sort of arisen in the context of India when it comes to work in this area? So what are the theoretical debates? It's, it's, it's not so much a theoretical debate as I think a practical debate. You see, the uh, you know, if, if you're looking at the way in which book history research has been done, um, now there are, it's, it begins with, again, as I said, people, Sort of tilling their own plot of land, but uh, you know, as a kind of a, as 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 the uh, you know soil gets loosened, as it were, <laughs> to to carry on this metaphor, you know, you're also looking at a larger picture now. You know, you're trying to sort of um, and what 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 became very popular, I think, in the West was these national histories of the book, where you're talking about the history of the book in Britain, history of the book in Canada, history of the book in Australia, in the U.S., and so on and forth. Now, uh, that, you know, when you think about a history, a history of the book in South Asia or India, you immediately realize that this is a doomed or a kind of a very, very problematic project. We had several conversations about this. I remember a, a panel in which uh, Prachi Deshpande, Roshal Pinto, Rimi Chatterjee and I were discussing this. And there was absolutely no, um, uh, you know, and we were, I, I was trying to push this conversation towards a possible, to the, to the possibility of a, um, uh, 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 a multi-volume uh, history of the book in India. And, and it, it just completely collapsed because you see this sort of, there is no clear fit between language and region in India. You know, that is, that, that, that is, that is the, that is the major problem. And you cannot every, and you know, uh, Francesca Orsini uses the term multilingual local. Everywhere you look, all the major centers of print that you're looking at printed in either many languages or at least two languages. And you can, there is, there is no neat fit between language, race, nation, area, in the case of India, and that makes it very problematic to talk about a national history of the book, to talk about a, a kind of a, a, a you know a, a narrative which would an overarching narrative, and and but there are connections, of course. You are looking at let us say there's a history of print, which is largely a colonial history of print, at least you know, to a, from the beginning of the from the middle of the 18th to the mid, middle of the 20th century. You are looking at let us say missionary. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, networks of print, which are sort of similar all across South Asia. There's a missionary nation at work, which is not exactly congruent with the uh, colonial colonial apparat apparatus. Sometimes there's a fit, sometimes there isn't. Then there is a kind of a network which is constructed of the school book societies, where there's a coalition of um, uh, local intelligentsia, the 
portions of the, the, the um, uh, certain as, certain personnel of the company, missionaries, and so on and forth. So you're looking at a, a bewildering multiplicity of models. And I think one of the problems is really talking in terms of, you know, we call our series book history in India, but, you know, we know how unsatisfactory it is. It is just a kind of, you, what do you say when you're talking about book history in India? You, you have to talk in terms of regional histories. And that is one of the things which I've personally been struggling with. I mean, if you're trying to tell a story about book history in this part of the world, how do you narrativize it? What is what is what are the what are the parameters of this storytelling? How do you tell this story? And you, do you tell it in terms of regions? Do you tell it in terms of language? Do you tell? Uh, but you, you see that all of these break down. And I've, one of the things I've been trying to figure out is to look for a theoretical model which will accommodate so you can you can you know these 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 differences or these diversities so you can maybe talks of networks and flows maybe you can talks of networks and nodes so you you know you 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 are looking at different kinds of uh, uh, formations uh, you're looking looking at different kinds of traffic for instance much of this study of mm. book history in india is also about mobilities not just about not just the movement of books books of course are portable they they famously travel and there is no control over where they travel to you know you don't know where they travel to but people travel skills travel um, so how do the how do these intersect uh, uh, poll porters booksellers distributors they all move machinery moves so again do we actually study this as a kind of history of movements and occasional occasional kind of uh, you know stasis for example such as in the Bortola trade in Kolkata or the Gujili books in, 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 in Chennai. So these are these are some of the questions which are I still haven't really found a satisfactory answer to. I mean what what is the framework in which we look at or do we or do we think in terms of um, technology? Do we think in terms of lithography? Do we think in terms of typography? Do we think in terms of script? Do you think in terms of um, uh, uh, the digital word? Uh, and so on and forth. So that's again not an answer, but just a kind of a, uh, you know the the, the problems mm -hmm. I think in formulating uh, the field as it were. Which uh, so mm -hmm. in a sense working with a narrow narrow focus is good because you're looking at just one um, you know mm -hmm. one publisher, one um, uh, you know one press or one one genre of work. But the bigger picture becomes mm -hmm. messy. Yeah. So this is uh, some of the uh, issues that you highlighted. You know are precisely those that we have we who have been at work on this with the school books archive at the university have been try trying to uh, uh, at least make sense of let alone you know try to find ways of uh, resolving them you know when it comes to classification there are books of all kinds you know cutting across areas regions so how do you classify you know who's doing uh, which board is recommending uh, uh, which book for use so there are also all of these issues that uh, you know, have uh, have you know are there for us uh, or for us to uh, take a uh, take notice of and see what could be done about it. But you know, in your case, in your as far as your work is concerned, you know, on the one hand, you know, you've been part of the book. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, it's not just school books that have been that you have been interested in. You've been looking at you know the rise of printing technology. You know, the, you know, the systematization of script and many other areas that would be of a great concern. To a book historian at large, and you have also written on uh, organizations that have been, you know, very active in their production and distribution, production and uh, production of school books. So, you know, as a book historian speaking to a group of uh, 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 people working largely in the area of education and especially school education, you know, what what do you think are the ways in which book history and the kind of work that happens in that area can help? Both historical uh, study of you know, school books, both historical and contemporary. What, what do you think this field can bring to the study of school books? Um, look, I mean, to first to begin with, I'm not an expert on ed history of education, so what I, whatever I will say will must have, must be taken with a kind of uh, that's a little health warning, as it were. So just a few stray thoughts because I've uh, you see one of the uh, uh, things that uh, you know is immediately obvious to anyone who's looking at early history of printing in South Asia uh, in India is that um, you know there there are two impulses that you see at work first at the, in the very beginning first of course is there is the missionary impulse and then there is the imperial impulse so there is the East India Company coming into being then that, that becomes a kind of engine uh, which produces print now if if there is a third impulse at work it would be the educational uh, uh, textbooks, uh, particularly in the first two decades uh, or the second 
from the second decade of the 19th century when all these uh, uh, school book societies, the textbook societies come into being in all the presidency cities, as you know, in uh, Madras, in Bombay, in Calcutta, and so on and forth. Uh, and that is that is a history which um, is uh, fascinating because it brings together a number of things, you see, because uh, when you are looking at, let us say, something like missionary printing, you are looking at um, uh, books which are being circulated uh, not by way of trade. There is no they are being distributed gratis. It's like, you know, we have no idea about where those books are going. Now, for the school books, the school books are perhaps the most, it's exactly the opposite. They are the most focused of all, all, all genres of printing in that we know exactly who they are for. So we know that this book is for this group of people, these group of students, these, this, these are the end users of these books. So there's a very clear relationship between the way the, way the book is put together and the mm -hmm. use that those books are put to. So for example, if you later in this um, uh, talk, maybe we'll have some, uh, you know, I, I, I can try and show you some of the examples of these early printing uh, as a kind of, you know, one of the first experiments in trying to mm -hmm. match the expectations and the needs of readers with uh, this sort of new technology that has, uh, Earlier, of course, there was a system of seminaries, tolls and madrasas and so on and forth and patshalas, which also uh, carried out a similar uh, 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 function. So there, of course, you had the, the book or the cribs that were prepared for that were handwritten. They were they were either palm leaf manuscripts or or sometimes they were um, memorized. They were they were not even written down. It was a kind of a oral exercise. So there is a production of text which was going on in this in the in the uh, uh, manuscript period. And it is, but what does print, the question that we have to ask is how does A, how does print change this? B, does print have a multiplier effect? Uh, does it mean that you can send the, you, you can actually send the same book out into sev several classrooms? Uh, you, you can build a network through way by which the book can travel. And that, that, was, and that, is, that is one part of the story. The other part of the story is how certain technologies are also coming together in this genre because in for school textbooks you need both text and image you need to have maps you need to have especially in the modern you know if you look at the 1810s books which the ge particular geography and astronomy books which are coming into uh, uh, are being printed they need to present to you a vis vis visible evidence of the world as it is of 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 of, the, of uh, t terrestrial geography as well as the celestial geography so you need also uh, you need to solve the problem of images. You need either lithography or you need woodblock engraving. So what what came together in these early textbooks was also good was printing uh, was 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 the craft of printing, but also the crafts which produced the images. That is either lithography, which you know originated in Calcutta in Asia in 1820s. So it's 18 uh, roughly 1820s. It's, it's two hundred roughly two two centuries of lithography, you might say, and woodblock engraving. So if you look, if you see some of the um, uh, um, um, early geography and astronomy books, and again I'm drawing attention to these, or indeed the animal animal biographies. I mean, it's not enough to tell your students that there is something called a rhinoceros. Um, you have to show what the rhinoceros looked like. But of course, the rhinoceros was native to parts of India, as was the elephant, as was the lion, as was the bear. The reason I named these four animals is that these were the first four animal biographies. Which was published by uh, which were published by the Calcutta School Book Society in 1819. All these had to be engraved. Um, there had to be pictures for the students to see what the lion looked like. So there was a man called John Lawson who did this, who was a kind of a trained engraver from London. Um, we'll come to the story of Lawson later. So you know, many things come together in in, in, in the production of school books, mm. and then there is the question of um, distribution and consumption. So you are looking at let us say schools in a certain cluster in the case of bengal the first schools primary schools modern primary schools originated in the chuchu chinsura chuchur area in hubli district where the reverend john may along with other baptist missionaries set up a cluster of schools now the question is okay there are schools now what what study material do you give to the children so that is one of the first impulses behind behind the you know beginning of this school canon as it were and then you also need to see how this system spreads, how this system spreads through the primarily through the imperial apparatus, 
of uh, of you know of, of officials in the field of district of inspectors of schools of deputy inspectors of schools of agents of sub sub agents and so on and forth so this is a kind of a fascinating um, you know a, a cartography of reading uh, so if you if if you wish to look at how india took to the book how we took to print one sure way of looking at it is through the medium of textbooks from the 18 you know 18 late 1810s onwards and how they proliferate across the hinterland um, i mean not all not all over india but you know to very 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 large parts of it um, but we'll, i'll come back to this i think because because this is this is this is obviously a question which uh, and you also asked me what how this helps us make sense of um, modern um, modern education educational publishing is that is that what you said Varda? uh towards the end uh, uh, hello Yeah. Yeah. Please. Sorry. Yeah. No. Sorry. Did, uh, did did I lose you? The last. Uh, so I, I was asking you. Uh, uh, no, did... That's okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the internet has been uh, rather uh, weak. The net connect connectivity has been rather weak. So I'm sorry if I lost you in between. Yeah, I did. I think I did lose you in between. Yeah. So I I I was I was saying that you know um. um um, did, did you also ask me to talk about um, how book history helps us understand the world yeah. of education publishing now in India? Or are you yeah, yes, to... yes, of course, yes, of course, yes. But I, I, I don't, honestly, I don't know about. I haven't thought about that because you see, I've been sort of cons, um, uh, um, sort of looking at and what what makes this genre of publishing interesting for me. And there's something I was saying at the end. Maybe you missed that. Is that um, because of the way in which it was able to spread into the hinterland. So you're looking at um, a kind of a network of um, inspectors of schools, um, the deputy inspectors of schools, their agents, their sub agents, and so on and forth, sort of apparatus of the Raj, how the, uh, the printed textbook was able to reach not all of India, but you know, uh, places where they would ordinarily not reach because you see if you're looking at the major centers of printing in India you're looking at in the, in the first half of the 19th century the radius of reading is not very far from the metropolis so you have Calcutta and um, you know Reverend Long for instance in the 1850s says that outside 20 miles outside Calcutta nobody's reading anything now that was a bit of an exaggeration I'll come back to that later but you see the <laughs> much of the reading tends to be concentrated in the metropolis because that is where any kind of any semblance of distribution exists. Is this a period where there are no no bookshops? You are dependent on hawkers, or you are dependent on these agents and sub agents who will carry the books with you, and hand hand you know deliver to some reader or some school somewhere. So you're looking at a very precarious system of distribution, where it becomes very difficult to talk about India taking to the book in a big way because simply the book doesn't reach. Um, the hinterland it doesn't reach a remote village so in trying to understand the reach of the book the school textbook is a very valuable tool because if we can follow the journey of the school textbook this gives us a kind of a case you know a kind of a skeleton exoskeleton of what would later become a much more robust system as the you know in the second half of the 19th century when the textbook markets become much becomes much more institutionalized and which Rimi Chatterjee has written about especially when the two you know, uh, behemoths, Oxford University Press, Macmillan, and also lesser behemoths, such as uh, Longmans and others, move into the very lucrative Indian market, then you can see this sort of entire system, entire net network taking shape. And it's, uh, but in the early part of the 19th century, mm -hmm. you can see the kind of early, early uh, 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 um, uh, sort of um, the opening gambits in this game. Of course, then by the 20th, by 20th century, this would become the most lucrative of all educational sectors. And, and as you know, anyone who knows anything about publishing will know that there's no money in trade publishing. It's all in schools and academic pub schools publishing. So if you want to make money out of publishing in 20 or 20 or 21st century India, you will go, and go into school publishing. Now, again, what is the history of that? What a, so again, the hmm. history of the choice of school books, the commit school book committees, the way in which, uh, you know, the, the politics of the committees, all this is very, something which has been going on almost unchanged from the 19th century uh, what are the prescribed mm -hmm. books how do you sort of um, you know how do how do you uh, 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 
um, uh, uh, sort of cancel your rival's books, as it were? How do you put your own book into it? This is, a, a, I, I mean, you know, a lot of anecdotes and not very <laughs> scandalous stories could be told, told about this, this aspect of uh, publishing. You know, in 1820s, uh, or 18, I think it was 1823 or 24, when Mount Stuart Elphinstone, the new governor, uh, governor of Mumbai, Bombay presidency, is writing a minute on education. This is one of the things that he is, uh, you know, explicitly saying. Those who are, you know, going into uh, uh, different parts of the uh, Bombay presidency, you know, who are also interested with the task of, you know, inspecting what kind of teaching learning happens in schools. You know, why don't you carry some books along, especially prize books? So who knows? One of the publication, one of the you know uh, very uh, interesting works that this Calcutta School Book Society brought out in a okay. I think we've again lost the uh, uh, internet from that end. I'll just we'll just wait. Yeah, I think he's we'll back. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't hear the last Hello? few uh, uh, lines there. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, you're good. I think... Um, you know, I can make perhaps I, I I think I have an idea about what Varda was trying beginning to ask, and uh, maybe I can anticipate his question here a bit because he's saying, I think there's some internet problems at the, on that side. Um, you know, there is um, if you look at the Baptist curriculum or if you look at what the Baptists were uh, trying to do, there was this one model book that they used, which was uh, a model system that, that they used um, by the Reverend Andrew Bell, which was I think tried at the Madra Madras Male Asylum Press. And that was a particular way of setting up a school. Uh, in Bengali, the title to it, that given to it was Patshala Boshai Bar Bavostha, or the way in which a school is to be uh, constructed. So there is a, you know, it's a kind of a DIY, DIY uh, book. In you know, this is the way in which the classroom is going to be, um, you know, the architecture of the classroom, how the, the teacher student seating, and so on and forth. So that's one aspect of um, pedagogy which was being in sort of implemented by the missionaries. So let, let me go back a, li a little bit and, uh, you know, sort of identify 1813. Many of you will know that this, the, that is the Charter Act of 1813 was when the Charter of the Company was renewed. And one of the things that the Charter Act, uh, sort of the, the one difference between the Charter... Ah, sorry. But, so I, I, yeah, I, I, actually was, I actually was going on a bit and talking about an, Andrew Bell's... Uh, you know, yeah. experiments yeah. with pedagogy. I sort of anticipated your question. So, uh, uh, may, may I go on? Uh, because, sure, sure, sure. Please, 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 please. So, 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 you know, as you know, 1813 was an important year because that was when one of the one of the conditions, one of the uh, provisions of the renewal of the Charter Act was that there would no longer be that kind of control over the missionaries that there were before. I mean, many of you will know that the East India Company was uh, notoriously allergic to having missionaries operate within the Bailiwick. So in 1813, that kind of sort of that that sort of uh, restriction was raised and 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 the missionaries were able to participate to a certain extent in the debate over education. And since they had already experimented with uh, schools in the Hooghly district area, there was also a kind of missionary curriculum which they had uh, created, which they had created, and they said that this could be, so this, you know, uh, uh, very, very basic curriculum where they talk about uh, what subject should be taught. So for instance, uh, uh, this, uh, they, 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 first there would be a simple introduction to arithmetic, uh, then there would be geography, then there would be history, then, and this was the five basic textbooks, um, then they said uh, selection from their own books and a selection of scripture ethics. Now, in 1817, when the Calcutta School Book Society is formed, and obviously its task is to, you know, supply school books to these new, new schools, they follow this missionary curriculum more or less in toto, except the last um, uh, uh, the fifth uh, uh, um, topic, which is scripture ethics. So one of the, the, the it, it was the stated aim of the Calcutta School Book Society was that its books would not have any religious content. It would be completely in a secular in that sense. It would not try to propagate any religion. Now the missionaries were 
not entirely happy about this. And I'm going to come to this later because this is actually interesting and often neglected part of this narrative. And this is also to do with this sort of debate, constant debate between the English and the vernaculars, which is going on. So when the Calcutta School Book Society begins to sort of commission these textbooks, they are in these four broad areas, arithmetic, history, geography, and, you know, fables or you know, kind of improving moral tales for more lack of religious instruction, there's a kind of ethics, morals, and so on and forth. Uh, and the, <coughs> the two genres which are very battlefield genres in that sense, not arithmetic, because arithmetic is pretty much the same. I mean, if you look at the early arithmetic books, you will see that they're used, they're, there, there, is, there is a clear acknowledgement of older systems of arithmetic that were was being taught in the tolls and the patshalas. Geography and astronomy are problematic because here you have to counter the Puranic geography and astronomy or astrology. So you have to sort of, you have to posit European geography and you have to talk about a heliocentric universe. You cannot talk about the Shumeru and Kumeru or the uh, Patal and the Swarg and so on and forth. So that that became an interesting battlefield. And uh, um, in, 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 in these early, early production of the Calcutta School Book Society, it also was in several languages. They were not just doing it in Bengali. They were, they had, a, and in fact, one of the things which uh, seems to me to be very interesting is that all of these school books societies called for textbooks in English as well as in Indian languages. And this is about two decades before Macaulay's 1835 minutes. So, you know, it's it's not as if it's suddenly Macaulay suddenly set a motion machine into motion and said that we'll have English education from tomorrow. It's not as simple as that. There was, in fact, uh, a kind of a ground uh, 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 demand which was being raised for it for it was about two decades before that and the school book societies are a kind of a con you know the formation of these school book societies are perhaps the beginning points of origin <coughs> excuse me yeah <clears throat> sorry about the, um, over to back to you no, again. Uh, i'm sorry uh, yeah <laughs> sorry i uh, the uh, uh, I'm, uh, 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 encountering issues with the internet and thank you for con uh, continuing with our uh, uh, with the conversation while I was away, uh, and I couldn't have access the net. So, it, uh, no, <clears throat> so you were talking. You know, my last question had to do with you know how uh, uh, you know bo the book history field can in inform the study of that. Now, two uh, ma uh, two major uh, pre uh, you know organizations into uh, in, uh, that you, uh, that were into production. Of the school book society and uh, so Calcutta school book society and the and the uh, Baptist mission Baptist mission press you know which was, which was first uh, I think 1801 uh, uh, and uh, while the Calcutta school book society was established sometime in 1817 now you know but if you uh, now there were there were already sort of indigenous schools you just mentioned the case of Patshalas and tolls now uh, you know, but when when uh, say uh, the members of the Baptist Mission Society, and it would be nice if you could also uh, tell us a little bit about you know the founding members of the Baptist Mission Society, when they and uh, when they begin to so they uh, now first of all it's important for us to understand that you know they were not just into textbooks, they were into many other things as well. They were uh, for both for their conti continued existence, but they were also very. Uh, a very important house when it came to public uh, trans publishing the Bible in translation as well. Now, so when they when they begin to produce textbooks, what are the sources of uh, dissatisfaction that they have with what is going on in the indigenous schools? So where does that begin? Uh, well, I mean, what are the sources of this dissatisfaction? Where do they find the uh, need to you know start something as textbooks? Okay, so let's one. Let me clear, let me clarify one thing at the beginning. There were in fact two Baptist mission presses. You see, the Srirampur missionary Baptists first set up a uh, mission in Srirampur in 1801 because it was Danish and uh, it was out, outside British control. Now mm -hmm. there they specialized, for, of course, in Bible printing, which was what they got money for. But they also made some money on the side by printing textbooks for the Fort William College. Now we are not talking about Fort William College here because that's not school textbooks. Those were textbooks for the future Kader of the Raj. So, you know, as Lord Wellesley set up Fort William College and as the as the company's sphere of influence grew, la, you know, language departments are added. So when, once, uh, you know, the, the Maratha gram, Maratha grammar becomes a necessity once the Anglo-Maratha wars are sort of uh, over. Uh, so that that is uh, something which is outsourced to carry 
Kerry, Marshman, and Ward. These are the three people, the so-called Sriramput, Sriramput trio, who started the press and the mission. Um, so their their work was a first with Bibles and tracts, which they published in uh, humongous numbers, and uh, to if we are to believe them, in forty different languages. And then they were given this sort of edition of Kerry particularly was asked to head both the Sanskrit and Bengali departments of Fort William College. So for the first decade, these these two, these were the uh, uh, sort of twin uh, uh, focus of their uh, publishing activities. In 1817, there is a fight among the Baptists. The younger brethren uh, accuse the older brethren, that is to say the founders of not exactly financial mismanagement, but they're not very happy with lack of transparency. So they schism and they set up a separate Baptist mission in Calcutta, 40 kilometers away. And you have this bizarre situation where within between 40 kilometers, there are two Baptist missions. One is the Srirampur mission and one is the younger Baptists at Calcutta. Now, in 1832, these would again merge. But there is a 13 or 14 year old period where they're not on talking terms. Now, the people who are involved in the textbooks publishing are actually the younger younger Baptists. The older Baptists, the Kerry and his associates, they are, they are in the second decade of the 19th century, they are busy empire building because they have now expanded all over Southeast Asia. You know, the, the Srirampur Mission Press was servicing a market uh, from Afghanistan in the West to Java in the East. So you're looking at a you know massive swathe of um, uh, activity. So and, and primarily they were sending out preachers, bro brothers and so on and forth with Bibles and tracts. I'm, I'm repeatedly using the term Bibles and tracts because these. So you had the larger books, which were either the Old and New Testament or you would have smaller books of the Bible or you would have small, you know, very, very thin tracts, which were easy to carry around and which you could give away freely. Now, the Calcutta Baptists were also doing this kind of work, but they were also involved with the Calcutta School Book Society, which was, again, if you look at the first committee, it's a mix of native intelligentsia, uh, some company officials and some missionaries. So this kind, these three, these three interests sort of con uh, came together in the Calcutta School Book Society. So there, and I, 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 I'd like to show you some of the title pages and, you know, the, and sure. the printing sure. Printing was also of a higher higher quality because the Baptists, the Calcutta Baptist missions were, they were very good. They developed font in a number of ty types in a number of at least eight or 10 languages, uh, four or five different typefaces in Bengali, in Urdu or Hindustani, as it was called, uh, in Devanagari, in, uh, in Odia, uh, 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 Persian and so on and forth. So um, they had very fine uh, craftsmen as well. So John Lawson, for instance, who I was talking about, was the very, very highly trained metal worker in London. And you will, you will understand how good Lawson was because you see, first when he came to uh, um, India, he first went to Srirampur, and he was first arrested by the company. He spent a night in jail. Then Marshman got in, you know, sprung him out of jail and said, we need him because he's going to do the New Testament in Chinese. Now he said, oh, Mandarin, he said, okay, is that, is that important? Yes, it is. Now, how do you how do you print the New Testament in Mandarin? Obviously, we use woodcut, but no, the missionary actually tried to do it with movable type. Now, you can imagine how, uh, uh, what an impossible project this is. The... Uh, thousands of pictograms or ideograms or whatever you call them in, in Mandarin um, were to be realized in movable type. And that was done by Lawson. Now, eventually the, Lawson has, after the 1817, he has had enough of Srirampur. He comes back to Calcutta and he begins to then carve these animal figures. And there's, I think, said the question on animal lithography. So let's, you know, see some of these, if we may, uh, for the next two or three minutes, sure, just sure, to give sure, an idea sure, sure. of what these books look like. Okay, just give me a minute while I... Um, uh, sort of pull these up. Uh, okay, so um, if, this is just random, not in any sequence. Can you see this? There is a geography book on geography title page. Is that visible, Varda? Yes, yes. Yes. So you can see here bilingual title pages. This is geography interspersed with information, historical miscellaneous, uh, a later edition of Pierce's work. Here you can see a sample of the maps that were printed. You can see here a map of the world, uh, which again uh, uh, in Bengali, uh, uh, and which is sort of uh, you know the the, the uh, Mercator's projection that we are familiar with um, of the two hemispheres, um, and with, with with names and very interestingly, Australia is named here New Holland. It's not uh, uh, you can see Africa, the Hindi Hindi Sagar. 
Pacific Mahasagar, you have you can see between the two uh, uh, orbs the colophon of the Calcutta School Book Society. So this is an uh, example of the early kind of uh, 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 engravings that would appear in these books. He wrote another book on geography, geography interspersed with this is the 1822 edition, which was done by Pierce. You saw the first title page was 1846. Uh, and this was typical, the kind of uh, bilingual title page. Uh, and you can see here that there is also this uh, colophon. There was much trademarked theft. I mean, the CSBS colophon became quite, you know, uh, the, the go-to go -to trademark and everyone copied this. That's a different point altogether. Here is arithmetic, the other discipline which was being um, taught. Gonito, or a collection of arithmetical tales, the late Reverend R. May of Chinsura, uh, rules for the application to business. So there was a kind of a dual purpose behind this, not just the teaching of arithmetic, but also business arithmetic of some kind. This is an 1821 mm -hmm. edition of the Calcutta School Book Society. Uh, Dialogues on Geography and Astronomy. You can see this again, 1827. By now, the typical typeface of uh, the Baptist Mission Press. Um, uh, uh, sorry, the Calcutta School Book Society's press uh, must be evident. Again, another edition of May's Gonito, May, again, Reverend May, who we just saw, uh, um, 1852 edition. And here, um, um, and that, then, of course, the four, uh, the four animals of Lawson. So this is uh, the first of the lot, the, the, the text on lion, Shingher Biborona. Of course, there's a story about it, which, uh, <laughs> which Reverend Long relates. Now, there's no, it's hard to believe this story, but on the other hand, it's also very difficult to disbelieve Long because he was the most indefatigable uh, historian, bibliographer, ethnographer of Bengali uh, and indeed uh, printed material in other languages of the 19th century. So Long said that when this book was introduced in a school for the first time, it created panic in the classroom because they thought that this was actually, this was the only line in the world and it was in their classroom. Now, again, I don't know how, uh, you know, how, how credible this story is and why a visual representation of love line, uh, maybe it was a turn of phrase, who knows, created panic in a school, but apparently it did. Here is the elephant, uh, which, which, uh, and also the, you can see there's a kind of a little background at the back where you can see a kind of village with palm trees and thatched huts, if you look at it closely. And then uh, you have, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go on, go on. Yeah. And then you have the third of these uh, animal biographies, uh, the the bear or the bhalluk, uh, which is, uh, it talks about the blue and the black bears. And finally, uh, rhinoceros, which does seem to be indebted to Albrecht Durer's rhinoceros. I don't know whether Lawson ever saw a rhinoceros, but uh, of course, there's this the whole body of rhinoceros or rhinoceri uh, uh, representation is a fascinating uh, kind of genre in itself. Yeah. Now, <coughs> um, Again, this is the work um, I was talking about earlier. This is the instructions and for modeling and conducting schools by Pearson, <coughs> which was modeled on Andrew Bell's experiments with uh, um, uh, the, the, school, the school, school, the classroom. So these are some examples of um, you know the early uh, uh, output of the uh, Calcutta School Book Society. Again, as you see, many of these are actually authored by missionaries. So Pierce, mm -hmm. Pearson. Lawson, all of them are involved in, likewise, <coughs> it would be possible to show uh, um, uh, books which are authored by the likes of Raja Radhakanto Deb and, and others, which were to do with spellings, which were to do with ethical tale, moral and ethical tales. So um, th there's, there's a wide range of this, but there's also a little, uh, I think, um, um, kind of a coda to this story. And the story is that, you know, when we're talking about um, these, these are all in Bengali, as you can see. Uh, but very soon there would be this sort of demand for uh, English language titles, which would come to a head in the 1830s and 40s. Now there is uh, 1813. These people are writing that, uh, and this is a very, in a sense, uh, remarkably uh, prophetic paragraph. This is this is in 1813 when the School Book Society, in its sort of, uh, it formed three language subcommittees, and in the English language subcommittee they wrote that. The English language, I'm just sort of reading a little bit. The English language possesses strong claims to the early notice of this institution. Though it were unreasonable to expect that it can ever become the vernacular language in the country, it ought certainly to be considered as an important instrument for the diffusion of useful knowledge, as it will probably ere long become the learned language in India, as far as Latin and Greek languages have been considered in Europe. 
as far as we can open to the natives the presence of the English language, so far we put them in the possession of true knowledge. Natives learned in the English may become highly useful instructors of their fellow countrymen. They may become the repositories of science in the country and no, at no very remote period may communicate the tone of general information. Now, this is actually the, somebody else ghosting Macaulay's minute some 20 years ago. But the problem with this is, you see, this comes to pass to a very large extent. You can see that after the 1830s, there is a gradual move towards English um, uh, 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 um, material. Now, this, and I, 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 was, I was recently looking at the uh, proceedings of a missionaries conference in 1855, which took place in Calcutta. This Reverend James Long, who I'm talking about, is absolutely livid about this. He says that, in, you know, there is, we have been distributing these Bibles um, for the last 30 years. He said, I can guarantee that there is not a single person who can actually read the Bible and understand it in Bengali. He says, why? A, he says, because we have tried to teach them English. We have not taught them useful knowledge in the vernaculars. Now, Long is making a point which has two, two aspects to it. On the one hand, he's bemoaning the fact that Bibles are not being read because he's a missionary and this is a missionary conference. He's giving this explanation why Bibles are not read. He said, A, you have written it in a language in a Bengali, which is incomprehensible to people. Um, though the Bible is about Eastern slash Oriental knowledge, it should be accessible to the East, but it isn't because you have written them in a way which no one can understand. It's an artificial and stilted prose. In fact, Long scathingly criticizes Kerry's Bengali New Testament because he, I've written, a, I've read a manuscript note where he said that he did not know any Bengali, he had no business translating the New Testament into Bengali. It was a very, he uses the word kacha. He says the, it was a very kacha translation. Now, hmm. Kerry is making the point that English education or education in English is only benefiting a section of the urban elite. He says that for, so for the diffusion of useful knowledge among the masses and and Long was absolutely sort of, you know, he was very gung-ho about this, that you had to spread education among the masses. He said English is not is no use at all because A, if you teach them English, they will try and spout a few words in English. They will not consider the matter in depth or they will try to imitate those in the city. And he said that there are four groups of people, the zamindars, the native rich, the government and the educated elite who could have been, who could have been helping um, the diffusion of useful knowledge in the in the villages but no one is doing it so we missionaries must do it this is a very strange moment in uh, where mm. where long is making this argument for vernacular education vernacular textbooks in the teeth in against the grain of what mm. the company is doing which is of course the macaulization of uh, teaching so it's, and his 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 uh, basis is a very very interesting kind of a uh, intervention in this debate, I feel. Again, I've not made entire sense of what he's trying to say. I've sort of been encountered this very recently. So just as a kind of something to think about uh, at this time, when these choices of languages and policies are very fluid, we are looking at the 1820s and 30s when language policies, all of these are, it's, it's at a very fluid state. You know, uh, on the one hand, there's this, there's this call for, you know, education, English, in, education, English. On the other hand, equally strong group, equally uh, sort of um, uh, strong camp calling for education in the vernaculars or giving sort of equal importance to both. And in fact, it is not true that vernacular education is immediately put aside uh, in the 1830s and 40s. It goes on for 40, 50 years. It is funded. The grants, mm. and one of the most important things is to look at where the grants in aid are going, where the government is in fact giving money, to what schools are they giving money. One of the interesting things is that, I'm sorry, I'm sort of digressing a bit from this, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's a heart of, of, of uh, the choices people make between schools. After, I think, 1853, I'm not exactly sure about the date, the company says that we are only going to give grants in aid to those schools which charge a fee. We are not, so so they were actually trying to push students towards fee, fee charging schools. And that, in fact, apparently sort of weaned students away from the vernacular schools which were free because they didn't trust something which would be given to them free so they went to the schools which gave which charged a fee however nominal and those were the schools which were give, being given the grants in aid so this is, it's a complex narrative which again has to be sort of unpacked in order to understand hmm. you know language policies language choices in the 20th century as well hmm. now coming back to the organizations that were into production of uh, uh, school school uh, textbooks you know, there are two other organizations, uh, for instance, the Christian Vernacular Literature Society and perhaps uh, the Society for the Propagation of Christian. Or they were also sort of producing primers in some measure. Now, how do these four organizations sort of, you know, uh, work together? Are they what is the kind of relationship? 
are they complementing one another or, or uh, you know what is going on between these four is there that's a way a that's a difficult question to answer because i a um, in the school uh, they were you see all the, the tracks that were producing and so on and forth there were some debates also about the interpretation translation of the bible that was hmm. that so the there there were there were uh, you know, but again that was that debate which i have only very very sketchy knowledge of about and you know the new you know new translations for example the language that is used on the translations that were uh, early translations were completely you know stilted and artificial by the time the baptists come along translators like ellerman and gogoli write a much more elegant bengali but apparently there was also points of interpretation about baptism about sacrament and so on and forth not uh, 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 which which uh, which um, uh, you know there was, there was debate between these organizations themselves so i'm not very sure whether they worked together i mean they were not certainly hostile to each other they were more or less covering the same territory but they all had an individual publishing programs so if you're looking at the tracks bodies there are several of them who are doing their own thing and are not necessarily stepping on each other's toes because again as i said this is the, the tracks economy is a bizarre economy because it is you are you are you are crowdfunding money from the from 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 the mission field and then you are uh, uh, every year in your annual general report your annual your you know, you know, annual report you're saying that this is these are the numbers of tracks we have sent out so it's almost as if there's a kind of a arithmetical sort of relationship between tracks send out conversions and so on and forth of course that those figures are very very disappointing um, so mm. you know that 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 economy by the 1850s again i was talking the missionary conference they get around to this that there's no point giving things away free so i think then at that point they read there is a kind of a reconsidering of how the um, how 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 the missionary project is going to go on but by, by the time the school school books has moved in a different direction altogether that mm. that's mm. become that that sort of circulated mm -hmm through the government machinery while the hmm. while the missionaries have been sort of struggling with the uh, with, with with the uh, very low returns from their publishing activities you know what hmm. they were doing for example in the in in the in, you know in doing dictionaries lexicons grammars all of this was very valuable but this i think by the 1850s they found out that this was largely if this had been a futile exercise this entire hmm. machinery of print and and which is which is which is a very strange kind of a scenario on the one hand you have created this infrastructure for print on the other hand your chief objective is defeated and that is that is uh, proselytization that does that is happen i'm not i'm, I'm not, i don't think that answers your question specifically but i'm uh, you know uh, this is the general story about all the tracts societies as such some of them for ex example when you talk about um, the, the calcutta school book society itself Mu uh, sort of uh, budded off and created something called a vernacular literature society, which was again, uh, again, there, there's a lot of missionary involvement in there as well, which tried to propagate or tried to uh, produce suitable reading for um, uh, the general reader because they felt that um, most of the, and especially the woman reader who had been a new entrant into this field, was reading either soft porn or erotica, which was the Bortola produced. I mean, there, there were hawkers who were taking all these courtly romances and so on and forth into the into the Zanana, giving these books to the women, and they were being quote unquote corrupted by these. So there was a there was a move towards producing more improving literature. So you had things like Hans Christian Andersen or Robinson Crusoe, which were being translated into Bengali. So again, this did not have exactly a textbook or a classroom purpose, but this was didactic in nature, and it was trying to supplant a kind of so-called vitiated reading culture with a more wholesome. Uh, curriculum mm. of reading. and again there mm. the missionaries played an important role not only that they also pushed vigorously to legislate against obscenity so the 1857 obscenity act in uh, um, england found a kind of reflection in india as well when certain kinds of uh, erotic uh, publications were uh, uh, punished by law now you know uh, so uh, if for a moment again uh, uh, going back to the uh, baptist mission society and the calcutta books uh, school school textbook uh, school book society now of course in some cases they have people in calcutta or in other presidencies who are writing books and whose works get published by these but it also seems to be the case that they are uh, you know uh, publishing or re or publishing again books that were already published uh, maybe in england or elsewhere now so what in and you also mentioned while discussing the uh, while discussing the case of both these uh, organizations how 
the curriculum uh, that was initially proposed by the missionaries was you know revised a bit the uh, Calcutta School Book Society. Now, when they are trying to you know recommend books uh, in accordance with the curriculum that they had in mind, what kind of choices are they making about books? Are they are they by and large trying to go by what is available? Or are they trying to commission these books to be written by you know people who are around, or are they abridging, revising, you know, as it happens in the case of Joyce's uh, scientific dialogues? So, what is going on in the way the book ultimately gets presented? The translation is actually quite an important uh, component because you know if you're going to do books quickly. Um, you know, in a quick turnover and so on and forth. So you are looking. You you will depend on. So for for extent, I, I already referred to uh, the translation of uh, instructions for conducting schools by Reverend Andrew Bell. Um, and then there is a uh, Aesop's Fables, for instance, were also being translated by. So there was Ram Kamal Shen, who was translating, uh, uh, um, and, uh, and before that Raja Radhakantu Dev, who were both trans translating already existing versions of Aesop's Fables. Um, so um, you know they, they, you see a mixture of both. So um, there are some which are sort of um, uh, um, commissioned. For example, uh, there is uh, Reverend Pearson, sort of um, in 1820 wrote a work called Bakkaboli or Idiomatical Exercises, and there was another one called A Book of Letters or Patro Komodi. Now again, these were new, and these sort of were catered kind of exclusively to for the use of the kind of uh, you know the, the, the these were bilingual books. And they were uh, uh, sort of looking at uh, a wide range of users. So you could either be somebody whose mother tongue was English, who wanted to know more of Bengali, or vice versa. So, for example, you know these bilingual phrase books were very typical of these, uh, uh, you know, new, new books which which were, but also the other history books which were being written. These were, um, however, uh, all either abridgments or translations of books which were already in existence. So, for example, let me give you one example. So um, then this was printed not at the Baptist Mission Press, but at the Sirampur Mission Press. This was a, a, a translation by Felix Carey, the first born of William Carey, uh, mm. called um, British Deshio Biboron Shomucha. And it is, its a, subtitle was Abridgment of the History of the England from the Rule of Julius Caesar to the Death of George II, translated from Goldsmith's History of England. So there were some standard history books, like Goldsmith's History was a standard. Again, parts of that were abridged and translated to Bengali by uh, Felix Carey. So there were, or, or as you say, the Joyce's, uh, Joyce's uh, scientific dialogues, uh, which, which, which was um, uh, translated into Bengali. But of course, you had to sort of, uh, you know, invest in that as well. Um, so you had to have these copper plate uh, images for that. Uh, so you have to, so that these, these, these works again, very interesting because they're working with older texts, but they're using local uh, 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 artists and artisans to create the kind of uh, images, the copper plate of the solar system. For instance, we know that uh, at that time there was a man called Ramchand Shonokar who was, who, who, who did that uh, in, in it and was paid 140 rupees. Apparently it seems uh, mm -hmm. there was another engraver called Kashinath Mistri who did um, vignettes and stamps. Uh, or plates illustrative of Pearson. So we have names of several, and another, we have another gentleman called Radha Mohan who did uh, 33 diagrams from uh, Euclid's geometry. So you're looking at therefore, yes, translations, adaptations, um, abridgments, yes, but also uh, kind of uh, the generation of, uh, you know, uh, new images, new new um, uh, artists being used to generate these, these uh, uh, um, so, uh, so there's a kind of a biplex feature to these works on the one hand, the text, mm -hmm. uh, and on, on, on the other hand, the images. Then there is also more, more translations that one could think of. There's Ricketts English Exercises, um, and this was translated. Um, equally, as I said, it's a mixture of two. There were, there were also this sort of early um, encyclopedia writing, the Vidhahara Boli, the magazine called Dik Doshon, which tried to produce useful knowledge. Again, so there is the genealogy of this knowledge systems is, um, you know, the texts are quite clear to us. Some, again, were locally adapted, locally used, and so on and forth. Yeah, well, before we begin to take questions from those who have joined us live, one, one last question, uh, one more question. Now, you know, one of the things that uh, if you look at uh, some, of, uh, some of the books that came from uh, this particular period has to do with the script used. Uh, there are several parts of this uh, uh, 
to this uh, issue of script. One is that if you take, for instance, the publication from the Baptist Mission Press in 1836, namely a brief account of the solar system, it is it is a bilingual text, uh, and uh, the uh, so it is English and Hindustani, but in Hindustani is now presented using Roman characters. So what you know script. Now, what explains this use of Roman characters uh, for uh, presenting you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, Hindustani text? What explains what, this? Uh, uh, two, the, 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 two more questions are related to that. Yeah. Okay, okay. yeah. May I, may I? So is this a one-off case? Or is it the case that you know, this was widely prevalent? We know that in the 1830s, Trevelyan was keen on introducing a single script for multi, uh, you know, a lot of, is this uh, is for Indian languages? So is this a reflection of that? Now, two, does printing and uh, you know, sort of system, uh, and the script uh, printing in different Indian languages, Bangla, uh, Tamil, and so on, does it lead to a systematization of typography uh, with these developments? So, yeah, just two questions. Yeah. Second question is actually very complex, but let me see. See, that Romanizing um, Romanizing impulse is actually quite quite interesting and, and much before its time. And, you know, of course, with the coming of mobile telephony, we are, we are all, we are, many of us are using, we have returned to Rom using Roman script while we text or tweet or so on and forth. Because now the, this, uh, you know, during the early days of Fort William College, at one point of time, the, Colonial administrator scholar threw up his hands in the air and said, "You know, there are too many scripts in this country. It's impossible for the uh, administrator to learn so many. So why don't we have a Rom single Roman script?" Um, and Trevelyan, as you say, he was the one who was sort of championing this for a while. Gilchrist, the, uh, the yeah. sort of uh, publisher in Urdu and at Fort William College, he was also very gung ho about this. He in fact published a polyglot Aesop's Fables in 1802 you know, or three, uh, which was in five languages but all in Roman script. So the same mm. same fable. Uh, I think it was called the Oriental Polyglot. Now, um, and there were in, there was in fact quite a uh, quite a sort of Romanizing mania for a while. Uh, let me show you one or two things. I mean, this I have this little um, folder of stuff. Uh, there's a few few uh, few examples which 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 you might find quite uh, interesting. Uh, here um, you can see one of this uh, this again animal biography as you can see here English and Romanized Bengali, the dog. Kukur, uh, as you can see. So this is a, a rather thin-looking dog, and you can the, 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 the illustration is also very interesting. I mean, we can maybe some other time talk about this. Why is this is such such a uh, strange scene? I mean, uh, and, and, and strange dogs, elongated dogs running at the back. Um, so you have here this. Uh, this is sorry. This is not. You can here have another example of that. You can see the entire. Uh, title page is in English, but part of it is in English Roman, Roman script. Part of it in English, part of it in Bengali, and the top half is in Bengali. Bongo Bhashar Monomala, Roman or Khore This is 1834. So as you can see, and this is printed in fact at the Baptist Mission Press. Um, here is a picture of the Sobhabaza Romanizing Press under the patronage and in part the residence of Raja Kali Krishna Bahadur Calcutta. So there, so you, you even have a kind of visual evidence of this Romanizing Press. This is again 1834. Uh, Niti Kotha, moral instructor, uh, Upadesh Kotha, uh, and so on and forth. So this is this is something which was experimented with, then found wanting, but it 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 probably has an afterlife in uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries in many languages, and indeed with the coming of digital um, with with the digital word, we have returned with a vengeance to the uh, to, to to Roman script while while writing in uh, Indian languages. So it's an interesting kind of a cesura in the history of print at that moment. I don't think it went very far as far as Bengali was concerned, certainly, because by that by the 1830s, good type had been cast. And that brings us to the second part of your question. See, uh, those languages which were typography based would obviously had sort of various kinds of improvements in typography as well as orthography. We know that uh, uh, in, you know, in Tamil uh, uh, um, uh, and, and in Bengali, simultaneous one was John Murdoch. Um, Reverend uh, Myron Powers, no, I forget the name. Uh, all uh, and in Bengali, Shochandra Bidashagor, they were all working with uh, um, in improving the, especially the conjoint. The problem was with the conjoint words because conjoint letters or characters, because earlier you would put one consonant over the other, uh, and if you had three consonants, you had to put one over the other, and the leadings, the space between lines would increase. So it was not economic for print printing. So you had to create a new glyph, which would not be three letters on top of each other, but you had a new glyph, which was a conjoint mm -hmm. letter. 
so these were sort of troubling solutions which were which were found on the fly but we must also remember that not all indian languages are typography based not all indian printing is typography based there's also a lithographic impulse and the lithographic you see from though lithography begins in calcutta in 1820 it then goes into the hindi heartland where in places like patna in ara in lucknow in allahabad uh, in agra you are printing in lithography in at least at least four languages persian arabic hindustani or urdu and hindi and it's much easier to set up a lithographic press because you don't need type you only need the lithographic stone you need somebody with good handwriting you see so lithography is particularly uh, congenial to a language is to to script which is more calligraphic in nature b if you don't have that much capital mm. you do, you, and you don't have uh, you, you don't have a type uh, you know somebody to cast type for you in these languages but lithography does perfectly well for you so mm. you are therefore looking at two different orders of um, I, i i think printing which were two distinct stories and you know francesca um, and and uh, ulrika have written about this uh, particularly francesca in her work on uh, uh, um, printing in uh, um, uh, varanasi and uh, in 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 in, in uh, patna so uh, uh, so typography dependent languages such as bengali and tamil will have a somewhat different trajectory uh, in these mm. cases um, and obviously because there were so many uh, agencies at work so the sridampur missionaries the baptist missionaries the indigenous uh, somebody like ishwarchandra vidyashagor other other artisans so there was there, there were sort of uh, development was rapid in the in this respect I think it is time to take a look at questions that we have received. I shall read out of uh, uh, you know two questions from Professor uh, Ravi Subramaniam. The first question is: Which Indian languages entered into print only post 1947? Could you point? Could you comment on or point to historic an analysis of this phenomenon? I one. can't answer. That. I I don't know really. I mean that I would also love to know that answer, but after 47. Uh, I mean, whether uh, and, and the question really is, uh, you, you know, why why didn't they come into print before that, or or even you know to extend that question further, where, whether in the digital world, in the, in the digital regime, whether where 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 some language scripts able to leapfrog print altogether, and uh, and arrive from script to the digital. World. But I I'm so I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that. But I would certainly be uh, you know if I, if some if I, I would try and find out about that. But I can't answer that right now. The second question is, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. Second question. Yeah. The second question is, how do books, texts in the wider sense, construct or shape the public sphere? Is this a major theme in book history? Yes. Uh, you see, the one of the I uh, think when when I'm talking about books so far, but I think the public sphere that we are talking about. Uh, is bet better studied through the lens of periodicals and newspaper publishing in a sense i i see that um, you know for example if you look at um, again i can only speak about the great what was greater bengal uh, in the 19th century i see just there's a divide between let us say the city and the what we call the mafasil town or the uh, you know the small town in that uh, and it's it's a very, it's a very broad generalization which perhaps perhaps holds even true even now that if you want to be If you want the cachet of authorship, if you want to be famous as an author, you come hmm. to a prestigious public ha- publishing house in the city. Whereas, if you are, if you are, you know, if you are part of a micro community or an interest group which is trying to, you know, uh, uh, draw attention to some particular aspect of uh, life, or uh, uh, you, you, you're looking at small periodicals, small newspapers. I find this the, the ecosystem of small newspaper and periodicals a fascinating. terrain for looking at a public discourse the the metropolitan print or the metropolitan press is creating a certain kind of public discourse of course but it is also uh, which is it is very heavily urbanized in certain cases heavily internationalized as well it's the discourse is uh, in a sense it, 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 the world view is of a certain kind but when we go outside the city i think when we go to smaller places and this is roughly after the coming of the railways because after that it becomes easier to transport uh, um, um you know print materials uh, distribution and movements become easier as small presses come out you know begin to a very high mortality or morb- morbidity rate of course we know about that but i think the public sphere is fruitfully studied i think especially in the second half of the 19th century by looking at these small presses small communities small uh, you know readerships 
uh, and, 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 and especially very focused newspapers and periodicals there. Therefore, we, uh, the, the periodicals uh, press, I think, is, is perhaps a more important field of study than the so-called and the sort of book, as it were. I don't know whether that's so, that's so. Would you like to mention uh, uh, some scholars who have done such work uh, for someone who would want to explore this further? Yeah, the problem is much of the work that has been done here is it been, hasn't been in Indian languages. So, you know, as I mentioned, I've mentioned the name of Brojendranath Bandhapadhyay, who's sort of whose work is quite extraordinary. Shondip Dotto, who's actually a collector of little magazines mm. in College mm. Street. <coughs> Excuse me. Muntasir Mamun in Bangladesh, again, a kind of polymath and uh, an extraordinary scholar. Um, again, as I said, these are these, these are the three people I can immediately think of. Of course, there are others. Um, and there are people who are now work, doing very good work in the periodical press on the on the periodical press in 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 uh, in, uh, in recent times. Uh, I can think of Charu Singh, who is working on I think scientific and educational printing in the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. Um, but again, or uh, Uma Mukherjee, who has written on periodicals. But this is the problem is a that periodicals have not survived very well, especially newspapers. Their survival rate has been very very poor. We have um, very few copies, and uh, you know, not not many of them are in good shape at all. Uh, and we are, in fact, dependent on indirect sources such as the native reports of newspapers, which were digests from the 1870s onwards, on on uh, various um, uh, 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 you know there would there would be a post uh, where uh, an office in the who would actually read all the Indian newspapers and sort of compile little digests, a weekly digest. From that we get an idea, but these are again. Not the actual real McCoy, so that's mm -hmm. it, that's that's a difficult um, uh, 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 aspect of book history to do again because of the poor survival rate of such newspapers. Maybe the 20th century is better in that respect. We have a question from Anurad Anuradha Kukriti who asks, "How does uh, representation, uh, you know, animal uh, representation and lithography, how does it change over a period of time? You know, and uh, do we see?" Any changes in the way you know animals are represented today, and what is the? I, I don't know. What, that's a. I saw that question, and I was sort of wondering how I could answer that because uh, I think um, you know his historian of, of visual cultures would be more equipped to do that, especially you know the time when color comes into being. You see, but one one um, perhaps you know one observation might be of use is that most of these, uh, at least from the first. Um, let's say two thirds of the 19th century, uh, there was what is known as an afterlife of images. Let me explain what I mean by this. You see, uh, uh, if you wanted to print a picture of a dog or a rhinoceros and so on and so forth, there were two ways you could do it. Either you could get a local artist to do it or you could buy uh, wooden wood blocks which were no longer needed from the British book market. So we have actually evidence of these being sort of a kind of economic dumping that you, you have all these uh, 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 wooden or zinc blocks which you've already printed with, but they're still there. So you can buy them cheap. It's a kind of remaindering of uh, the, the, the images. So you see throughout the 19th century periodical various kinds of images appearing, which seem very incongruous, which seem like, to, which look like a kind of a scene from an English village, which look like a kind of, uh, you know, completely out, out of joint as it were and then the story behind that is it is actually cheaper to get them to buy them off buy them from some printer in england who has no use for them anymore and it's you know so people will be shipping these again we don't have enough data about this i found one or two sort of instances of of, of blocks being bought from a london publisher called charles knight by the calcutta school book society so then you reuse them and then it is therefore it is possible to see this afterlife of images where you see a first appearance in a periodical somewhere else and then you see a kind of subsequent appearances and this is not just true of school textbooks you see this in imaginative literature as well for instance in children's books uh, for, from the, on the late 19th and early 20th centuries for example the grand the father of shotojit ray the filmmaker shukumar ray who was um, uh, editing a magazine called shondesh uh, frequently, you you find that they use their own images, but also in their work, you see uh, images which have appeared elsewhere. So, uh, you know, 
so it is that history of images has to be seen in this sort of i think it's important to see the lineage of all these images as well i mean this is not a direct answer to a question but just a kind of complicating the story a bit further about how images travel um, we have a question here asking uh, we have a question isn't a national discourse of read uh, isn't this national discourse of reading tending to get monolithic this is from preetu haldar certainly i think that is what i i, I was trying to say at the beginning that when we thought you know we have been moving away from that though we we are calling our book book history in india and uh, one of the first things i was saying was that is about the impossibility of these um, national monolithic projects i don't think they are they are they are, uh, you know you can do that <coughs> i mean yes, you can have maybe a to z or a kind of companion you know that is that is fine but the moment to you know try to write this so called national history is it there is a danger of you know you looking at the main, you look at the main narratives the main centers and you collapse other other centers or other narratives smaller narratives into this kind of a, you shoe horn them into this so you know that i completely agree i mean you know that is there is there is there is a danger and we have to be very very careful when we write um, and when we when we make claims about uh, indian book history or south asian book history so uh, the next question is about the mathematics textbooks uh, you show um uh, so are the primarily uh, translations or adaptations of books already available in english did uh, there were the uh, bengali authors who wrote books uh, uh, perhaps on mathematics uh, I, i suppose uh, in the first half of the 19th century yes, yes they were they were towards the 1850s and 60s there were tons of bengali um, uh, you know once the textbook markets becomes flourishing everyone is trying to write, getting everyone wants a part of that market so you see competing versions arithmetic is a very very big market and you know uh, there there are dozens of books on arithmetic on on algebra on higher 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 arithmetic as well so in 1860s 50s 60s 70s uh, there are a number of people who were so it's so the lead so the first push ball is set rolling by the missionaries but then this is picked up by a number of uh, right number of uh, local writers and uh, and it's you know the, the, there is no end to them uh, not just in arithmetic but also in other languages and in fact these again um, the, the sort of uh, battle about which will be prescribed is is as a cutthroat one Uh, as we will see so yes certainly there is uh, um uh, i want next uh, the next question is uh, about censorship uh, i wonder where within the spectrum of uh, media publications in early 19th century what kind of censorship may have existed then this is from malika censorship question is very interesting because it's quite counter intuitive the people who suffered most from censorship let's say i'm using the word suffered in a slightly you know whose uh, way the people who suffered most from censorship were in fact the missionaries because you see for till the 1820s they had they got rapped on their knuckles whenever they tried to write anything controversial because the company was absolutely paranoid about the missionaries propagating christianity with any kind of vigor and uh, uh, kerry and his associates were repeatedly chastised for uh, you know uh, sort of you know uh, 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 publishing tracks which may have which may inflame passions and so on and forth so um, uh, for a long time this was a kind of a, a bone of contention between between the missionaries and the uh, but this sort of became waned over time and the censorship that we know of is in fact a product of the 20th century you see till till from 1867 there is a press and registration act at 25 but that is Uh, um which which makes it compulsory for you to register your printed work with the british raj so everyone so the raj knew if what no oh, sorry not the raj the crown knew what was being printed um but they didn't really exercise any explicit censorship over that it was only towards the 1890s the last decades and if you see if you read graham shaw's work you will understand how legis- this is in count there is a kind of category such as seditious books and so on and forth begin to appear more and more in the in the library in the quarterly catalogs there are uh, legislation the indian indians indian um, sea act and the you know post postal act which, which which can tamper with envelopes and so on and forth so censorship as such yes there are certain cases for example the case of um, certain famous cases for example the case of um, uh, the the play the indigo planting mirror which was originally a bengali play neel dorpon which was translated into english in 1861 
but uh, again, curiously and counterintuitively, the translation was carried out with, gov with government money. The government, in fact, facilitated the translation because they wanted to embarrass the planters. It sort of backfired. And in that case, poor, poor Reverend Long, who came forward to shield the government, had to go to jail for a couple of months because he was sued for libel. That is the one of the very few instances one can think of where somebody actually went to jail and not just, and in this case, he was a sacrificial lamb. He was not the writer, nor was he the publisher, nor was he the translator, nor was he the uh, uh, financier of the work. Um, but towards the beginning of the end of the 20th, 19th century, censorship begins to kind of hmm. manifest itself with the rise of nationalism, rise of uh, you know certain works which are heavily critical of uh, the government. We have a question about uh, the technology of printing. Is there evidence of hybridity involving both manually done illustrations like in Pothi and manuscript tradition alongside the printed world in early printed texts, early colonial printed texts? That's an interesting. See the yes, because you see in early in early modern you know the period of the 16th century, the Inquinabula, you see a lot of a lot of books which is, which are printed but then duplicated by hand manually. Now, that's kind of hybridity I have not seen in the Bengali book where you have uh, manuscript as well as the printed uh, technology. What we do have is a hybrid of lithography and uh, typography occasionally. Um, but I have not seen, um, maybe there are examples, uh, I've not seen instances where a book is has traces both of <coughs> mechanical reproduction as well as um, script. There are imitative imitations. For example, the uh, genre of writing, which was designated as Musulmani Bengali by Reverend Long in the 1850s, uh, or were, were called Chapa Puthis, printed manuscripts, they were called, which of course, uh, you, know, were, were, you can't have chap Puthis with a Chapa, which are printed, but they closely imitated the layout of the <coughs> manuscript Kissa or the uh, but but they were not hybrid in that sense. Um, I'm also trying to think of uh, again a small body of material which has been completely neglected owing to our insistence on a print nationalism and a print modernity. Ala Benedict Anderson is that this whole body of manuscript um, work, scribal uh, 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 text production, which still continues to this day. We still have wall magazines. Okay. I mean, when we were growing up, and of, of course, when we were, many of us were growing up, one of the things we often did at school were wall magazines. In the 19th century, there was a very um, uh, uh, um, sort of visible uh, and robust economy of handwritten magazines. We know that during 1857, I mean, uh, there, there is a body of, uh, uh, Chris Bailey has written about this body of material which was circulating in manuscript form. But I don't, I don't think anyone has studied that because uh, there's very little left to study. Uh, but even in the 20th, 20th century, the manuscript or the, or the, or the, or the manuscript magazine, um, handwritten magazine, the wall magazine, the bulletin, they have it a life and they should be studied in some capacity or the other. Um, again, not hybrid perhaps, but part of this narrative, I feel. The next question about is about curriculum. <laughs> you, uh, you spoke about, uh, you know, how when the Calcutta School Society began to function in the one of the things that they sort of de, uh, de, uh, moved away from was uh, the the religious scripture part of the missionary curriculum so the question is uh, within the secular curriculum uh, what degree of the sacred sort could sort of come in through the school textbooks again it's hard to answer this within in, in a few words but but let me tell you that this is again one of those strange um, narratives where, uh, in fact, when uh, you know the Hindu college, which was later become Presidency College, comes into being, and when students are being uh, sort of recruited for this college, there were the, the the teachers in the college, many of them who were people of you know people of cloth, were absolutely paranoid about any kind of religious let's read Christian teaching being. Uh, 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 propagate in the classroom. For example, we have a story from the uh, uh, biography of Michael Modushudan Dutt, that one of the great poets of Bengal. How, at that, in that, they were given one an, a new new member of the faculty who had come, or or maybe a sort of visiting faculty, uh, 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 a missionary had 
called seven or eight students aside and given them very handsome volumes of the New Testament, you know, uh, sort of quarto editions and so on and forth, and beautifully bound, given, given to them secretly. And when David Hare, the educationist, found out about this, he went berserk with rage. He called them and probably had them caned. There's a sort of there's a reference to corporate. But why did you take those Bibles? But there was there was absolute fear that if any kind of overt Christian education was imparted in the classroom, it would this it would uh, uh, the parents would simply withdraw their walls. So you see, there is this kind of tension at the, on the on the one side. But the missionaries are complaining about this because they're they're saying that there there isn't enough scope for. Uh, sort of uh, religious education within the curriculum that is being uh, uh, proper that, that that is being upheld in the in the in the in the, in the, in the schools and colleges of Calcutta. So there is a tension here, and this is this tension is expressed in the 1855 missionary conference quite 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 clearly. So the as far as I've been able to see, that the sacred does not really have. I mean, in in the kind of schools which are supported by uh, the the either first the company and then the crown. There isn't much room for this. I suppose, again, I might be mistaken. There may be examples, but not not um, uh, any that I've been able to find. So this remains a very determinedly secular kind of curriculum. So uh, we have a question from Urmila Unnikrishnan, who I believe is also work is also uh, working on nineteenth century uh, science publications in K uh, Malayalam. So, uh, so Urmila Nikishan asks, can you say something about the scientific and technical glossaries published during this period? Where they were connected to the language question and many uh, vernacular book committees uh, 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 that engaged with them. That's a very interesting question, though. Uh, there is an early attempt to do that, uh, for example, with books of chemistry and so on and forth, um, which were uh, products of the uh, press, uh, Sirampur Press. There was a uh, uh, principal of Sirampur College called John Mack who wrote a textbook on chemistry uh, and, 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 and tried to write a kind of a, a glossary for that. But I think as far as I know, again, it's not something I know a great deal about the attempt to write, uh, create a good a glossary and uh, 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 um, language for uh, Bengali text, science textbooks would be a 20th century uh, phenomenon. Particularly, we, I'm thinking of uh, Acharya Prafulla Chandra, uh, the, 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 again, the great chem chemist, scientist, uh, uh, the, the, the educationist, and so on and forth, who was very, very interested in the question of uh, Beng Bengali, uh, uh, Bengali glossary for science. Uh, but I'm, I'm afraid that uh, you know this is not something I've paid a great deal of attention to, and uh, and I will look out for this if I can find any evidence in the Bengali textbooks of this period. Uh, as I said, the only one or two I've been able to find are, in fact, uh, the early chemistry textbooks, which is which is where one area where this is, of course, uh, a very pressing need. Uh, as far as uh, physics books are concerned, we have Okhay Kumar Dutt, of course, who was uh, uh, who was a very interesting figure. Who he was the uh, principal of one of the normal schools. The normal schools were uh, training schools for teachers, not for uh, uh, younger students. And he had a very famous press called the Budodoy Press. In, in Hooghly, where he also was a principal of a normal school. And from that, he printed a number of books in physics, Bajjogustur, uh, Bichar, uh, etc., uh, where again, he was he was engaged in creating a vocabulary and a terminology for the physical sciences or the natural sciences, as they might have been called at that time. Um, what is that incomplete answer to a question, perhaps? Uh, I think we have an, we have another question, and may, perhaps this is the last one. Were there any kind of overlap between the production of textbooks for vernacular and English schools, or did they have different social trajectories in terms of subject matter, subjects, etc.? Say after uh, eighteen for uh, uh, nineteen, yeah. Not that I'm aware of. I mean. Uh... Sorry, what date, what date was was what was the cutoff? Eighteen eighteen fifty after eighteen fifty four. Um, the most of the Bengali books that I have been able to look at do not seem to, um, you know, as, as I said, many of them are in fact translations. You see, uh, and they are trans the sources are could be uh, twofold. So if you think of the you know the most uh, kind of prolific writer of textbooks and uh, publisher of textbooks of that period, who is Ishwar Chandra Biddashagor, um, who is, of course, a man of many parts. Uh, Biddashagor is translating from, on the one hand, uh, Marshman's History of India, 
on the other hand uh, chambers moral precepts on the other hand he's also translating from the curriculum of fort william college so he is translating the betal pachisi of laluji lal into betal panchabingshoti he is translating uh, so there is there are very uh, and he's also sort of doing these digests of uh, or medizis of or, or whatever you call it concise vers abridged versions of uh, shakuntala of of the sanskrit uh, sanskrit plays and uh, uh, and epics um, uh, so um, these are these are the you know we, I, I do not see that there is a, the question of overlap is concer concerning them very much at this point of time. The English textbooks that are being taught are usually uh, anthologies. So let us say one of the one of the most uh, you know um, sort of sought after literary properties, often pirated, was the Paul F. T. Paul Graves' Golden Treasury, which comes into being towards the end of the nineteenth century. But most of these English textbooks are anthologies. Um, and 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 so uh, or readers of certain kind. Uh, so the question, the, so the overlap is not really that pronounced. For example, if you think of Shakespeare, let's say, in many cases, what was studied in the classroom were in fact uh, uh, abridged versions of Shakespeare. The first ever Shakespeare uh, redaction in Bengali, 1848, was from Lamb's Tale. So, were two removes from Shakespeare. So you have this kind of uh, uh, ecosystem where you have Shakespeare's plays, then you have Charles Lamb adapting them into uh, in, into a prose form and then somebody translating that into bengali so again a kind of multi multiple kind of textual uh, 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 versions of the same kind of material could uh, be produced for different sectors of the market um, depending on what you were looking at so uh, or what what you were yeah it's it's uh, uh, 645 perhaps time to uh bring the session to a close um yeah so thank you very much for all, all of you for joining this session with and also sending in your questions and thank you very much for your time and patience in responding to all of these questions and all those that like we saw coming in from those who have joined this live. Thank you very much. And we hope to continue with this se uh, series. And we uh, and you will get, soon get to hear about the uh, next uh, conversation in this uh, conversation very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, much, everyone. And thank you for the question. I'm aware there's some question I could not address. So you know, if you're interested, I could maybe later talk to you about this. So I don't, though I, 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 there's no guarantee that I can answer them. They're all very interesting questions. Much food for thought. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I, I hope you continue to stay well and safe in these difficult times. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, very, everyone. Yeah.